There's not going to be a reset from the top down. It's not going to be Russia. It's not going to be China. It's not going to be any of them saying, oh, we've seen the light and we're going back to a gold standard. That's all nonsense. Because if they do that, they lose their power. Because the, the governments right now are so big and they have to pay so many bills that they can only pay them through inflation. If they ever go back on a gold standard, they've got to get rid of like 90% of government. And then all those people hit the streets and start rioting and then, you know, kill the other 10% that are still in government. That's what would happen. So no, they're, they're, nobody's going to go back to a gold standard. Gold standard is going to be a bottom up thing. It's going to be the dollar dies. All the derivatives based on the dollar die. The it, anything denominated in dollars is now worthless. And gold is gold and silver are the monies that are circulating. So whoever has gold and silver will be the new government. Rafi Farber of the Endgame Investor is patiently waiting for the monetary system to collapse and the dollar to die so that humanity can move on from the cycle of endless wars and government corruption and return to sound money in the form of gold. Crucially, Farber emphasizes that any move back to a gold standard must be initiated as a bottom-up process rather than a top-down decision imposed by major nations. A noteworthy player in this scenario is China, a nation that has significantly increased its gold reserves reaching an unprecedented high of 2,191.53 tons in the third quarter of 2023. Farber argues that China's successful transition from the current fiat currency system is facilitated by its deep integration. However, he acknowledges the intricate relationship between the United States and China, suggesting that escaping the consequences of a collapse or significant change in the existing monetary system is challenging for any major player on the global stage. The recent trend of central banks collectively buying 337 tons of gold in the third quarter, the second highest on record, raises questions about the potential impact on currency stabilization. Farber cautions that the mere accumulation of gold by central banks might not suffice unless there is a steadfast commitment to making that gold exchangeable at a fixed rate. He contends that for gold to truly play a meaningful role in stabilizing currencies, there must be a public belief that the currencies issued by central banks are genuinely exchangeable for gold. Join us as we delve into insights shared by Rafi Farber. To stay updated with our latest uploads, be sure to subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you. My aspiration is that most people in the world that stack gold and silver are good people because we're the ones who are doing this now and we're the ones who see it coming and everyone else is like, oh, what are you talking about? The dollar is king and they don't know what they're talking about and you know, let them fall. Let the people who have gold and silver uh, take charge. And uh, we should see a new world order that way, but it's not going to be BRICS gets together and says, oh, we're going back to a gold standard. Now we're going to be in charge or the, the Fed saying, you know what? This is true. The, the government, the dollar is really gold. And we're going to go back to that and everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine because the inflation has been 50 years in the making. Um, and if we go back to the Great Depression, how long was the inflation? It was from 1921 which was uh, the post, there, there, was a, there was an extreme deflationary event, 1920, 1921. It was even worse than the crash of 29. Um, and from 1921 to 1929, that was eight, that was just eight years of inflation. That was it. That was it. And then after eight years of inflation, there was a crash and you had a depression. We're talking about now 50 years of inflation. So eight times, let's say six, it's going to be six times as worse as, uh, as the Great Depression doesn't mean it's going to last 60 years, but it means it's going to be very extreme in terms of uh, wealth realignments, very extreme. And uh, unlike the Great Depression, when the dollar was still functional, because what you what it did was deflate the dollar back down so that it would be uh, more on par with a with the gold exchange rate, then people got poorer, but the dollar was still functional. Now people are going to be poorer and the dollar is not going to be functional. So it's going to be much worse. Um, but uh, afterwards, the world will be much better uh, if you survive it. No, I think there's zero chance of that. They're not going to do anything like that. Um, the, the would, first of all, it would be impossible for China because China is so enmeshed inside the American economic monetary system that they can't get out of it unscathed. It's not like it's not like you know. A, China is on top of America or more powerful because they produce the stuff and America produces the dollars, but it's all a circle. Like it goes together. And once the dollar dies, the Chinese can't continue their economic system as they have. So they have to, you know, they're, they're also part of the inflationary system. So when it, when it collapses, they have to reorganize their entire economy. And that requires 
everyone who's participating in it now to be destitute and find something else to do because you have malinvestments. This is what Mises said. Like the boom, it alters the entire structure of the economy. So people are doing things that they wouldn't otherwise be doing if money was honest. So everything that the Chinese are doing now is because of the inflationary system. But even if they do, it's not going to help them to accumulate any gold. Right? It doesn't matter how much gold they have because in order for it to, me to mean anything, they have to make it exchangeable to the public because they, they issue currencies. Currencies are for public use. If the public doesn't believe that their currencies that are issued by any central bank are exchangeable for the gold that they buy, what's the point of them having gold? What are they going to like, you know, divvy it up among the, the, the administrators of the bank maybe, and then just like leave. They could do that. They could just like outright steal it or, you know, give it to their, their, their heads of state or whatever, whoever the top honchos in whatever government they are. And just like, give them a few bars and then send them to some Pacific Island or something. But it, it doesn't really, it's not going to stabilize currencies, no matter how much gold a central bank puts on its balance sheet, because in order for that to matter, it has to be exchangeable at a fixed rate or else it's irrelevant. In the economic landscape leading up to November 2022, the inflation rate stood at 7.1% for the preceding 12-month period, marking a marginal 0.1% uptick from October. Notably, hyperinflation is defined by a 50% increase within a month, and history notes the U.S. experienced an unprecedented inflationary surge of 30.19% during the Revolutionary War in 1778. Rafi Farber warns of rapid hyperinflation. He emphasizes the Federal Reserve's role, suggesting increased money printing could swiftly devalue the dollar. This may make holding cash in banks riskier, leading to a shift to tangible assets or other forms of value. A notable metric in this context is the decline in the value of assets held at the Federal Reserve's overnight reverse repurchase, on RRP facility, nearing a 60% reduction from its peak in December 2022. The sharp decrease in inflows, currently at around $1 trillion, aligns with the Fed's assertive policy tightening implemented since the previous year. Farber warns that declining reverse repos may cause deflationary pressure. This, coupled with potential increased money printing by the Federal Reserve, signals a possible end to the dollar in the coming months. Let's get back to the interview. Keep the minimum in a bank. I'd say keep a few months worth, uh, maybe three, four months worth. Keep replenishing it after a few months. Make sure you have enough to pay your immediate bills. Um, but when we started to the road to hyperinflation, like uh, you, you'll know it and you'll gradually lower your balances in your bank account until you just want to keep them as close to zero as long as possible and not have any balance in there. And that is hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is just basically the lack of willingness to keep cash in the bank. So uh, we'll maybe start at six months and then we'll go to five and four. And, uh, but eventually it's just going to, it's just, it's just going to explode uh, when, and I think when the, when the fed turns around and has to print when those reverse repos run dry. So uh, I d personally, I don't think that we're going to see like one month, like let's say 10% and the next month, 15 and the next month, 30. I think we're going to see like one month, maybe 10 and the next month, like thousands. That's what I think is going to happen. And yeah, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm hoping that, but the, the, the next fed printing round is going to have to be so extreme that I don't see how the dollar can survive it more than a few days because once it happens, Anyone who owns treasuries overseas is going to sell them as quickly as possible when they see the Fed's buying. They're just going to get rid of them, take the dollars, and buy whatever real assets they can all. And like in, in, in the modern world, you can do this within a matter of hours. So yeah, I think hyperinflation is going to be just one month. It'll be like really annoying, bad inflation, maybe 10, 15, 20% maybe. And then the next month, just like it's gone. That's it. Done. Yeah, spare dollars are basically the dollars that are left over that couldn't make it into the banking system in 2020 and 2021. Uh, for whatever regulatory reasons, or uh, they had no place to put them because the cash has to be backed by assets on the other side of the balance sheet and they couldn't get any, any more assets in because their balance sheet was full. I don't know exactly how it works, but for whatever reason, they couldn't put this cash in the banks. So they give it back to the Fed and it's called a reverse repo. Uh, so that, that account, the uh, the amount of reverse repos outstanding are now at $1.07 trillion and they're down about $1.1 trillion in October. So uh, that leave, uh, sorry, they're, sorry, it was about $500 billion in October. So it's about the rate that we've been going since October is about 500 billion. 
down. So that leaves at that rate about two months before they go to zero, or maybe three months if you want to say that the, the rate's going to slow down a little bit. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But So I say two to three months before the reverse repos are now zero, and then what happens when the when the treasury you know, auctions off another set of bonds or treasuries and there's no more money in the reverse repo facility, who's going to buy them? Not the Fed, not uh, anyone else, because the money supply is shrinking, even though the reverse repos are flowing into the system, which means the deflationary forces are humongous. And those deflationary forces, what, what are they actually? Well, it's uh, bank loans being paid back at low interest rates that were taken out maybe two, three years ago, or even before any, any time between 2008 and 2020, all those loans that were given out by banks for whatever reason are being paid back at that low rate. And money is not in, in order to open a new loan to originate a new loan. You have to use the, the current interest rates, which were something like six, 7% if you're going to get, get a, an equity line or, um, or a credit line from a bank. So no one's going to want to pay that. So they're just paying down their old debt, not issuing new debt. And that's why the money supply falls. So imagine how much the money supply falls when there's no more reverse repos coming into the system. It's going to even contract even harder. So uh, at that point, something's going to break. The Fed's going to have to print a lot more. And uh, that should be the end of the dollar. Two to three months away, maybe four, maybe five. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's coming. Will the ongoing shifts in gold reserves, concerns about hyperinflation, and the delicate balance between money printing and deflationary pressures lead to a fundamental transformation in the world's monetary order. Share your thoughts in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.